In the video you're about to watch, we're going to cover the entire process of rebuilding this set of Dart Pro 1 CNC big block Chevy cylinder heads. We're going to be going through and replacing all the valve guides using the power of thermal expansion and liquid nitrogen, which is a pretty cool process. Then we're going to move into our performance valve job, cutting the valve seats, getting ready for our new valves, and then moving on to resurfacing the heads, which as you can see, all of this is already done here, but we're going to show you the entire process before finally ending with building the heads, which is going to include having to test these monster valve springs that, I mean, I can barely even make them budge. If you have ever been inside an automotive machine shop in your life, chances are you have probably seen a tool that looks exactly like this. This is the Remac Tools Big Blue Valve Spring Tester. They were first patented in 1930. So over 92 years, they've kind of been the standard of the industry. There's other spring testers on the market, but this is the one that my dad bought in the early 80s when he was first opening up shop. It's pretty heavily used, used and abused, honestly. It's probably tested thousands and thousands of valve springs here. On top of being pretty heavily used, I mean, it's still in good condition for lighter springs, but we can only test up to 500 pounds on this one. Obviously these springs here test a lot higher than 500 pounds at their open pressure. Now the Remac valve spring testers were off the market for a number of years. These used ones even were, you know, going for a pretty penny there on eBay or anywhere you could really find them because they're just so easy to use and they're durable and it's really a good product. Fortunately, the Remac Big Blue spring tester is back on the market and Remac has been gracious enough to provide us with a brand new Remac 1,000 pound spring tester. So we are very pleased to have a 1,000 pound capacity spring tester here in the shop to replace our Remac that my dad opened the shop with and has used for almost 40 years. I want to give a really big thank you to Remac Tools for helping us out with this video and providing us with this tool to use in our machine shop. Not only that, but keeping us moving forward for almost 40 years here with this older version. We're excited to get it going and we're gonna jump right into the video here with getting the valve guides replaced in these heads. These guides are manganese bronze, and as you can see, they are a shouldered design on the top side there. Given we're working with aluminum heads and the heads have also been ported, the head material is pretty thin on the combustion side, so rather than driving the guides out like we normally would and risking damaging the head, I opted to go ahead and pull the guides instead. Luckily, a 3816 tap was perfect for the job, so I tapped some threads in the end of the guide, screwed in a stud, grabbed a spacer, AKA a big wrist pin, and a thrust bearing, and another spacer, and then basically by screwing the nut onto the stud, it pulls the valve guide out of the head. This was definitely more work than simply driving the guides out like we would normally do on some of our cast iron materials, but being these heads are aluminum, and as you can see, very thin on the ported side, we wanted to go ahead and do it the safest route possible to avoid any risk of damage. After cleaning up the guide bores, I went ahead and put both heads in the oven at around 250 degrees Fahrenheit to aid in installing our new guides. As all of you should know, aluminum expands when heated, so by heating the heads, we're expanding the diameter of the guide bores to help overcome the interference fit. In addition to help us get these guides installed as easily as possible, we're cooling the valve guides themselves in liquid nitrogen, which is going to decrease the diameter of the valve guide. What do you think? I think this is kind of fun. <laughs> To handle the valve guides, we simply had them threaded onto a piece of all thread with a nut on each end, making sure the nut was small enough to fit through the bore itself. And as you can see, with the head heated up and the valve guides cooled, we had a clearance fit making the install super smooth. So the head's at around 190, 180. <laughs> Too low. You won't read it. So zero L. That little laser thermometer wouldn't read the negative temperature of the liquid nitrogen, but liquid nitrogen does sit at around negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit, and we were letting those valve guides equalize to the temperature before installing them. Like any professional would do, we headed over to the kitchen where my mom had whipped up some ingredients in the mixer, and we made homemade ice cream using the leftover liquid nitrogen. After our break, it was time to get moving on sizing our valve guides, so here we're measuring the intake valve stem and setting our small hole bore gauge to zero based on that size. In most applications, you're going to find that the exhaust valve stem is machined to a slightly smaller diameter than the intake valve stem, in this case about two ten thousandths of an inch smaller. As installed, the valve guides had between one and two thousandths interference to the valve stem, which obviously isn't going to work, so we're using a diamond valve guide hone here in the drill 
And basically what that's doing is honing material out of the inside diameter of those valve guides. There are a lot of shops out there who only ream their guides and don't even use a diamond hone. I'm not saying that one or the other is better, but what works best for us is the diamond valve guide hone because we found that it allows us to reach a higher level of accuracy on our size, as well as keep the guides straighter and more perfectly round. That being said, it is a labor intensive process and it takes a lot of time to get perfectly right, which I'm trying to do here. And the reason that I wanna get the valve guide perfect is because the valve guide is the foundation for the valve seat. So if you don't have a perfectly sized guide, it's going to be that much harder to get perfect valve seats. And keep in mind, when I'm saying perfect, there's always a tolerance to everything that we do here in the machine shop, but we always try to stick by the motto, if you're gonna do something, do it right. On the intake guides, we came out between 1.7 to 2 thousandths clearance. And on the exhaust side, we have a little bit more clearance at around 2.1 to 2.4 thousandths. One last thing to note on honing guides is that you are also left with a crosshatch finish, which aids in your lubrication, but it seems that professionals of the industry disagree on whether or not it's necessary to have crosshatch for oil retention in a guide. As far as I'm concerned, it can't hurt. These big block Chevys have canned valve guides, so I have the dual axis rollover fixture here on the Surdy, and we're getting it leveled up here. Basically what we do is stick a pilot down one valve guide, put that little bubble level on, and that's gonna get us locked down close enough so that the Surdy can go ahead and do all of the final alignment from there with the patented triple air float system that I've talked about in previous videos. On the intake side, I've chosen a multi-angle cutter that I think is gonna match pretty well, and here I'm showing under the microscope how I set up that cutter to basically match the seat where it already is. Because if you go too small, you're just gonna be burying the seat into the head before you have your full angles. If you go too far out, you're gonna push the valve seat outside of the valve face. Getting prepped to cut our first valve seat, I'm basically getting the machine aligned the way that I like. And here you can see the pilot running down into the valve guide as our tooling approaches the valve seat. I'm running around 400 RPM, and you can see that the bottom angle and the top angle cleaned up right away, but our seat angle still has not cleaned up. There you can also hear a little bit of chatter that I'm fighting, which obviously we don't want to have happen, so I try slowing down the RPM to see if I can avoid it, but we're still getting it. That's okay, because I wanted to go ahead and check on the valve where we're actually seating, so that we can tell if we are too far in, or if we could go a little further out on our diameter. This is sometimes called bluing the valve, although I'm using red dye from that marker. Now, looking at this, it looks like our seat is clear out to the edge of the valve, but I could tell that we actually had a little bit farther to go. So here we're making an attempt at doing that, and you can see that we got a nicer finish there on the valve seat, and we're nice and far out on the valve, just like we wanna be on this race head. Flash warning on the next clip because the slow motion video doesn't agree with the LEDs on the Surdy. What you can see there is the bottom angle has cleaned up. So now we're chasing after that seat angle. The top angle has come in and over on the left hand side you can see there is no seat angle but on the right it had already cleaned up. So we'll make a little bit more of a cut and there we have our finished valve seat. Including the angles that were already there, we actually have five angles on this intake valve seat. Now the exhaust seats were much more badly worn, so it was difficult to see the geometry. So I'm actually using this tool that I can measure against the valve and then set our cutter based on the diameter of the valve. Now our exhaust seat cutter is a little bit different. What you're gonna see coming in first here, which is actually kind of matching what's already there other than a little bit bigger, is a radius. So instead of a bottom angle, it has a bottom radius. Next, we're gonna see the seat angle come in, which is 45 degrees and 60 thousandths wide. And you can see on the back side, we don't have our full seat angle yet, but on the front side here, we already have top angle. So we're gonna continue cutting just until we have that seat angle cleaned up and a little bit of top angle all the way around to know we have our full seat width. Here's a slow-mo shot. So we have that bottom radius coming in, followed by actually our top angle and our seat angle on the left-hand side but on the right hand side, you can see where the seat is worn. So we're gonna continue cutting until we see that wear go away and make sure that we have our full seat angle cleaned up so that this valve seat will seal and has the proper valve seat geometry. And one thing you might have noticed by now is on these exhaust seats here, we're leaving kind of a nasty edge there at the bottom of our seat cutter. So don't worry, later in the video, we're gonna come back and just kind of blend that in by hand so that we don't have that nasty edge.
While we were set up on the exhaust side still, I did go in with one more cutter to take away the bulk of that sharp edge there to make it easier to hand blend. As always, another thing that I do while the head is set up there on the Surti is vacuum test all of our valve seats before we're done cutting, just to make sure all of our seats pass our quality check. The last operation I did on the intake side was a de-shrouding cut above the top angle to blend into the chamber a little bit better. For this cut, I'm basically just using a radius cutter, and I'm going in, and you can see that we have kind of a nasty edge, both from the valve job I did and the previous valve job, and we're just blending the top angle directly into this radius so that the valve flows better into the combustion chamber. So here's a quick little shot of what the final product looks like here. We've got our intake seats cut and our exhaust seats cut, but the one last thing that we need to do is on the exhaust seats, we need to kind of blend our new valve job into the port a little bit better. So here what I'm doing is I have the grinder set up with a cartridge roll and I'm just going in and hand blending the bottom seat angle into the port a little bit better. It was mostly just a feel thing. Cosmetically, you probably would not have even known the difference, but just taking my thumb there, I could kind of feel, so I'm making sure that that blends really, really well. All in all, I was pretty happy with the way the intake seat and the exhaust seat looked in the chamber, considering I think I'm at least the third valve job on this set of heads. I opted to go ahead and resurface the exhaust manifold side of the heads because they did look a little bit rough. So here's a little bit of slow-mo and just some cutting action of the fly cutter that I use on the exhaust side. Um, it's kind of sketchy. Definitely keep your fingers away from this. Moving on to resurfacing the heads themselves. We're running a PCD cutter here on the RMC 1000 surfacer. And basically the goal here is to take as little material as possible to get the heads flat again. As you can see, they were warped a little bit and did have some funny wear. Looks like um, maybe working on the cylinders or where the pistons had hit in the past. Around four thousandths, we still had some wear marks where the cylinders were between the cylinders on the head. So we took some additional cuts. You may have seen earlier in the video, this chamber had a little bit of damage. So I touched it up with the cartridge roll as well at this point and went ahead and took our final cut. I did go ahead and put some tap magic across there just to kind of give it a nice surface finish. I think both of them took around six to eight thousandths. At this point, we're pretty much finished up with all of our machine work, so we're going into the spray cabinet for our final wash. As you can see, earlier on, before I started filming, these heads had been glass beaded as well, so they are super clean. At this point, it's just getting all of the oils that we used when we were cutting and honing and so on, getting all of that off the heads, getting all of the cuttings blown out perfectly, and making sure that the heads are clean and dry so that we can move on to our final assembly. As you can see here, the finished product is really looking really, really nice. That PCD cutter always does such a nice job on the surface, and the seats look great as well here. You might be wondering, why were these heads even here in the first place? Well, as you can see from this valve, these heads had suffered a catastrophic failure. Luckily, none of the valves were broken, but we are replacing all of the valves because almost every single exhaust valve was bent, and most of the intake valves were bent as well, or at least half of them. And here you can see this one, when you chuck it up in the drill chuck there, you can tell that it's definitely bent. So we do have new intake valves as well. They are all stainless steel, swirl polished, and they are also back cut on the intake valves. Now, despite the fact that these are brand new valves, we always like to put them in our valve grinder and grind the valves because we have confidence in our machine and we've seen too many brand new valves that just don't pass our quality standards. So here on the intake valve, we just ground that one. And here's a little bit of slow-mo on the exhaust valve showing the stone is already touching on part of that valve face, but the other part of the valve face, it hasn't touched yet. So we'll continue grinding until all of the valve faces are trued up and we're confident that all of the valves have been ground correctly. Finally, we've come full circle and the last thing we need to check is our valve spring pressures. The first thing I wanted to do though is I had them send a calibration spring as well so that I could go ahead and double check the machine before we started using it. The calibration spring is just a quick and easy way to always know that your spring tester is working properly or if you need to have the tool recalibrated. Now that we know the tool is calibrated, we're gonna get ready to test our springs. And based on the spec we were provided, we're installing our valve springs at two inch installed height. I wanna test the closed pressure of our springs with the retainer to get an accurate reading since it is a double spring. 
So we need to account for the 87 thousandths thick titanium retainer, effectively testing the pressure at 2.087. For a quick and easy test like this, we'll just use the scale on the right hand side. And what we're gonna do is read that scale at 2.087 and lock down the collar on the spring tester so that we're testing the springs each at the same exact height. It should be noted that the face of the dial does change here, so you need to rotate it to zero out your needle before you start testing your springs. These are lightly used springs and the customer did not provide me with the exact specification. So basically what we're looking for here is to find if any of the springs are severely off from the others. For the closed pressure on all of the springs, we came in at about 295 pounds. You can also use that red needle there if you want to get a high point so that you don't have to be looking at it while you're trying to hold the valve spring down and reading the height. But since we're using the collar lock, it's pretty easy to read the gauge. If you want to get a really accurate height reading, Remac also makes a dial indicator bracket for the tester, which is as easy as removing one screw to install. This bracket can then be adjusted to the height needed for your application, and it comes with an extended dial indicator tip that will likely be needed in most cases. Unfortunately, the indicator I got is a lug mount indicator, and you actually really need a flat back indicator as the lug mount interferes with the tool. I will be buying a flat back indicator to use with the tool in the future, but for this, we're just doing kind of a quick and dirty test, and we don't need to be as accurate as you can be with a dial indicator. Now when you start testing springs like this that are over 500 pounds pressure, you really want to have the tool bolted down to the bench. And if this bench top was finished, I would have bolted it right to the bench top. But after two years of having this bench, we still haven't finished the top. So I opted to bolt the tester to a piece of plywood for now to keep it sturdy while I was testing these springs. The springs varied by less than 1% open pressure. So we're happy with that and confident that none of these springs are worn out. Finally, here we're measuring all of our valve spring installed heights so that we know how many shims to set up under each valve spring. The reason that we have to use shims is because these heads have been done multiple times in the past, and since we're just cleaning up the valve seats, we don't have as much control over how deep the valves end up relative to the spring pocket. As always, when we're installing our valves in the head, we like to use assembly lube on the valve stem. That keeps everything lubed up for the initial start. So we're getting all of the valves installed in this head. Since our valve spring compressor cannot handle the pressure of these valve springs, I am gonna be doing the install on the TCM25. With the valves installed, I'm using a wrist pin and my cell phone to get the valve spring seats level relative to the machine. Next, we're gonna be just double checking one more time with our shims to make sure that we are hitting that two inch installed height within plus or minus around 10 thousandths or so, which is relatively insignificant on the spring pressure at the installed height. I have one of our spring compressor adapters installed in the chuck of the TCM25 guide machine here, so we can run the spindle down to compress the spring in order to install our keepers. And I did have to ask my dad for a little bit of help on that one because I had my hands full and hadn't locked in the spindle. Here we're installing the intake valve stem seals and double checking that we have enough clearance between the retainer and the seal at full valve lift. At this point, I had already installed a few on my own and I kind of had it figured out. So I basically run that spring down so that it's compressed. And here you can see a close up of getting the valve keepers pressed into place. Again, we're working with some pretty aggressive spring pressures here. So everything could pop out of place if we're not careful, but it's pretty simple. Just run it down, get the keepers in place and run it back up. And before you know it, you have an assembled cylinder head. All in all, I was super happy with the way that these heads came out. Race car stuff is always a ton of work and usually it has been blown up sometime since the last guy worked on it. So anytime that you can come out with a set of heads that looks as nice as this set, it's a good day here at Jim's Automotive Machine Shop.